All right. Good morning, everybody. My name is Chris Gardner. I'm the senior software engineer at PW Operations down in Huntsville, Alabama, and I am here to talk to you this morning about beginning Windows Phone 7 development. Is everybody excited? Yay! This talk's going to be a bit interesting because uh, if you've been paying attention to the Windows Phone 7 market lately, you'll realize that they changed the SDK last week. So we, I spent all last week developing with the new Mango tool so I could add that to this talk. So, uh, were any of you in Charles' session before this when he went over some of the basics? None? Cool, I get to start from the beginning. Okay. Talk to our sponsors first. Recruit wise, they're here. They're everywhere. They do stuff. No. Um, go talk to them. Without them, we wouldn't be able to do this. And then my chosen sponsor for the day is Dev Express. They have lots of nifty tools. They'll do a lot of good. I don't use them, but hey. They're still good guys. They give me lots of good free shirts. All right, what we're going to talk about today. First, we're going to talk about some of the interest stuff. We're going to actually uh, talk about. Game Studio itself and the Windows Phone developer tools, getting onto the App Hub. Then we're going to talk about basically what you need to do for a a game that would get you started currently on Windows Phone 7. And then we're going to talk about some of the new Mango tools because there's the, the XNA and Silverlight integration together is really nifty if you use it correctly. So let's start with the new and necessary tools. The Windows Phone developer tools are available from the uh, App Hub. We'll get to that here in a second. They are available either standalone or you can get them bundled in with Game Studio 4 so that you get the Xbox and Windows game development at the same time. Integrate straight into Visual Studio 2010 in all of its forms, including the Express editions. Uh, and it supports development for Windows Phone 7. It comes with an emulator. And if you actually become a member of the, uh, of the Creators Club, you can actually unlock phones and it will port it right to the phone. Uh, the previous edition, just for some historical context, uh, Game Studio 3 was for 2008. It had Zoom support. If you don't know, Windows Phone 7 was actually the Zoom team's version of the Zoom this time. Uh, so it, some of the stuff kind of came over from there, but they actually don't even support Zoom development in version 4. And then there was Game Studio 2 and 1.1. Uh, features. You can use avatars, and you do get network access with a Windows Phone game. Uh, it's really hard to use an avatar on a Windows Phone game because your screen's so small. But you can do it. Uh, there's all sorts of rules about what you can do. Uh, you cannot connect directly to Xbox Live, and you uh, do not get access to achievements because I don't want people writing games that just throw out 100 achievements left and right. Because you know you all would do it. Uh, the App Club, like I mentioned a second ago, this is your one-stop shop for everything XNA related. It's create.msdn.com. Uh, it's free to create an account, get access to the forums, get code samples. People like me troll the forums all the time, ask questions for everybody. Uh, lots of sample code. If you want to know how to do it with XNA or on Windows Phone, that's your place to do it. Uh, if you want to actually publish, then there is the Creators Club account. It used to be called the Creators Club. That's what I call it now because I can't even remember what it's called. Uh, back when it was just the Xbox 360 indie games. It's $100 a year. It's also $40 for three months. Uh, if you have a .edu address, you can get a student account for free, but you can't actually publish a game. But it will let you unlock the phone, move something over, uh, move something over to an Xbox 360 for free. Uh, just can't publish it to the marketplace. You get to publish up to 10 Xbox 360 indie games with that. You can publish five games for, or five Windows Phone apps for free. Uh, I think you can publish as many free things as you want. You can charge for five things, and you have to pay to charge for more. Uh, also lets you copy code to 360, and then you get peer review and content review. Once you remember, you can develop or unlock your phone. This was just a standard bought from... Actually, I get it imported from Europe. That's not the point. But this is just your standard Windows phone. Uh, I actually have one of the ones from GDC that was hardware unlocked from the start. But that was the standard phone. You pay your money. You have to submit an app to the marketplace. You submit a Hello World. They're going to send you something back saying, no, you can't put another Hello World app on the marketplace. But after you do that, GeoTrust will verify you. You have to enter a bunch of information when you first create your account. And they're going to make sure all of it is accurate. After they make sure all of it's accurate, then you will get this lovely little thing where, if I jump out for a second, 
there is a program in the developer tools then called the uh, developer phone registration where after you've been uh, verified, hook one of these guys up, type in your Windows Live ID that's the member of the Creators Club, and it will unlock that thing that fast. Uh, the weird thing about actually moving something over is you have to have the Zoom software. It has to be running. The phone has to be open and unlocked for it to do it. You'll get all sorts of strange error messages that don't make sense. And you have to be, uh, and you actually have to have the, the live ID ready, well to go. So that's your basic how to get into the marketplace, how to get your tool set up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Any questions about any of that before I move on? I know that was kind of quick, but that's mostly overview stuff. So the general architecture for an X and A game. This goes the exact same between Xbox 360, Windows. Windows Phone, all of it, use this exact same thing. Matter of fact, if you go to my next session where I actually pull out the Xbox 360, you're going to see a lot of the same slots because it's a lot of the same stuff. You've got your general game class. It's got an initialize. It's got a load content. Then it, in a circle, calls update, then draw, then update, then draw, then update, and draw until you exit the game. Then it calls unload pro content. Like it says here at the bottom, update and draw can run simultaneously in separate threads. Uh, at the in your initializer, you can specify a fixed frame rate or a floating frame rate. If you specify a fixed frame rate, update and draw kind of run in separate threads because something will call thread will call draw on your particular frame rate time, and then update will run as often as it can. If you don't specify a frame rate, it will just call update as soon as update is done, or call draw as soon as update draws. Just loop around. It's just useful for knowing when all of a sudden you get weird threading issues because you lock down your frame rate. I've seen it. It's nasty. Uh, update. Basically, your update, you want to deal with your gestures there. Uh, there's built-in gestures. You actually can actually, uh, you, you can say, I don't want to use gestures, and it will just tell you your hit points of every finger that hits the device, and you can manually manipulate that. If you do that, you're crazy, but you can do it. They've got a bunch of built-in gestures where you can say, okay, if somebody does a flick, if somebody taps the screen, if somebody drags their finger, just tell me what's going on. We're going to, in the examples, you'll see me use gestures. I'll specifically be using uh, drag and tap. Uh, at the beginning of your app, you say, I want to use these gestures. In your actual update, you say, is the gesture available? It'll tell you, yes, we captured 15 gestures since last time. You loop through them all, you read them all, you process them all. The problem is, is that once you read a gesture from the touch panel, it automatically deletes it. So if you want to check something more than once, or you wanted to span it across multiple controls, you need to cache that so other things can read it. You'll see that. And you will also get lots of them per frame. Like if you do a drag animation, you'll get generally somewhere around the lines of 10 hits off a of, of drag. Uh, you also have access to the hardware back button. That's it. You don't have these two, but you do have access to the actual back button. Uh, and you get it by going into gamepad, get state player index one, and then you query it like a button. Which makes no sense unless you've actually played around with keyboard states or Xbox 360 game controls. But basically you just say that and then you say is back button pressed. You'll see an example of that when we actually get to the code. As far as screen layout goes, <laughs> x-axis, y-axis, there's your origins. Uh, the reason why this is important is because if you notice y is counterintuitive to the way you would think of a y-axis going. I always like to point that out because when you start increasing y and the thing goes down, it will drive you crazy. Uh, X and A does support an item called components. You have your main game loop. Components actually emulate that. If you have the, the components running, the base class of update, and if you have a drawable one of, uh, of draw, will call your main code, and then it will loop through the components array and call, call all their updates, call all their draws. So it's running everything in tandem. Uh, the good news about components is it makes it really easy to find particular things. You don't have this really long game loop with all your initialization code. Uh, if you have a lot of them, Manage them can be 
Uh, all of the uh, all the things will update themselves. Uh, there's some inefficiency issues if you use them too much, and I I actually do that on purpose, so you'll see that. As far as audio goes, uh, you can natively just add MP3s, waves, or WMAs to your project. They just become part of the content class, and you can just play them. Notice you can just play them. You can't stop them. Uh, so if you have a really long MP3, yeah, have fun with that. It'll just play until it decides to finish. Uh, to get around that, there is XX, which stands for the Cross-Platform Audio Creation Tool. It's really a nightmare to use. I'm not going to do any audio here, because uh, one, it would take too long, and two, a little bitty phone you can't hear anyways. Uh, but that's where you can actually take long files, set up cue points, play, pause, hit individual areas, All right, let's actually see this stuff work. That's when I need my handy chair. So the first example I have here is actually for Windows Phone proper. But you can use today. I'll actually be porting it over to this by the end. Uh, when you create one of these, just for... I'm going to say new project and you have either the Silverlight Windows phones, which we're not talking about today, or in Game Studio you get the phone ones. This list is slightly longer than you would normally see because I have the, the Mango Beta tools installed, so there's extra options there. But you would just create your project and you would get a blank template. When you create one, you get your main project and you also get your content reference project. Uh, they keep them separate so one, to, so you don't inflate with uh, your main project with a bunch of images and fonts and things like that. But also you can actually create custom uh, content projects and things that dynamically generate and things like that. So that's why it's separated all. You'll notice for mine, I have a bunch of pings with, you know, uh, transparent backgrounds and then I have one font. Uh, fonts are actually... XML files. They're references to the font. So here I just, I'm saying I'm using Courier New. You give it a size. You tell it, like I want mine to be bold. You say, here's the actual characters I want to do. Because what's going to happen is, actually in your game when you use a font, it's going to take all those characters, arrange them, and turn it into a bitmap so you can render it. So this is just a reference to which parts you need. Let's actually get into the game, though. Here's my main game. When you actually create the game proper, you're going to get your constructor. You're going to get initialize, load content, update, and draw. Those are your five main methods that are given to you by the code. We're going to step through some of this. What I've created is a little game that comes up, and it's, it's asteroids. You have a little spaceship, you drag your finger around, it'll move the spaceship, you tap screen, it'll shoot, get hit three times, you die. No big deal. Uh, so let's start picking this thing apart. Actually, let me show it to you first. Let's run it in the emulator. So you can actually see it on screen. We've got a little splash screen. Game comes up. We've got it rendered. Press the button. And you can move around. You can shoot. Not much to it. Uh, so to do that, we'll just start at the beginning. In, inside of your main game class, it, we've got I've got some arrays to keep track of the stuff. This actually locks the frame rate. I've got, I'm actually calling a web service at one point in time to do a high score list. So this is just references for the web service. Then I've got some code to show adding and subtracting components. We'll get to details on that in a second. Initialize, I have a helper class that actually handles my controls for me. 
There's two good reasons to do this. One, remember me mentioning if you pull off a gesture, it's gone? Well, now per frame, I can say, give me all the controls for that frame, and now anything that needs to use it can call what actually happened during that frame. Also, this guy is actually based off of an interface. I've got a set of game components here. It's actually based off an interface, so notice I borrowed this library from my other talk. Uh, Chord portability. This exact same game I actually have running on an Xbox 360, and because I have everything done to an interface, I just deal with the controller mapped to the exact to the particular part. As far as the control state goes, I'm enabling myself to be able to use a tap or a free drag, so that when I actually get into my update loop, I say, "Is there a gesture available?" If there is, I say, "Okay, give it to me." Which one is it? If it's tap, I said, okay, they fired. If it's a free drag, I say, if this is the first time I've gotten a free drag, tell me its position, and then I always take the, the last one, so that I get the starting point at the beginning of the frame, and I get the ending point at the end of the frame. I use those two to figure out how much they moved, and then I can tell my ship to move that position. And then that's where I check to see if they hit the back button so I can exit. Pretty straightforward. There are 10 million examples on the App Hub that actually show you this in detail. So I don't want to get, you know, I'm limited on time. And then I add it to my components list. And the load content. This is where I actually pull up all these things that I need. This is where you actually load all your content from the content project. For the main part, that's where I load the bitmap and position the bitmap from that splash screen. That was for the company logo. There was the code stock logo. I also load the font so I can render the score and everything. One of the nice things, and we'll get to this in a second when we do the, the mango part, but you actually can get full-blown threading. So all those stars that were twinkling in the background, I create them in a separate thread while the splash screen is running. And all it does is it says, okay, create a thread, start it. This guy loops through, creates 100 stars in the background, adds it to the components. Because it takes some time to develop, to do those things. That's why I've got them hiding in the background. You don't get threading when you're running a Silverlight app. Well, you don't get true threading like that. Splash screen waits five seconds, moves on. And then I've got some game states here. I've got a enumeration called game states. It says, hey, I'm loading, I'm in the splash screen, the game's running, the game's paused, things like that, just so I can control where I'm at. All I'm doing is, once again, segregating my code so I can tell what's going on. These things get big quick. I did a version of this talk, and the code's available online, where I did everything in the game class, and it became a nightmare fast. Don't ever try to write a game in an hour while people are watching. It's not fun. Uh, the only interesting part here is the actual game class. So let's go into it. First thing I do is I say, hey, did they back out of the game or did they pause the game? We actually don't have a pause on the Windows phone. Here I say, do I need to create a new an a new asteroid? I set a timer at the beginning and said, hey, every half a second, throw out a new asteroid. It creates a new asteroid, it adds it to the components. We'll get into the components after I show this. And then I do all my coll collision detection. I say, go through all my asteroids, go through all my bullets, see if a bullet and an asteroid hits, hits each other. If they do, give the player some points, Remove the bullet and remove the asteroid. Pretty straightforward. After I make sure all that happens, I then say, hey, see if any of the asteroids hit the player. If they do, remove a lot. Uh, 800 by 480? Uh, it's the way I'm doing it, and there's more than one way to do it. The way I'm doing it is every frame you're given this thing called game time. It has two important at, uh, properties in it. The first one is the total time the game's been running. And uh, if we look in the menu real quick, 
I reset the uh, the time when the player starts. And then it also gives you an elapsed time, which I should be using in here somewhere. There's an elapsed time, which tells you how long it's been since the last time update was called. And it's accurate down to milliseconds. Uh, so all I'm doing is I'm saying, hey, here's, here's my half a minute, a half a second time span. Subtract off the time every time when that guy hit zero. I create a new one. I go again. Uh, that's pretty much how they tell you to do animation. It's based off that time. It is fairly accurate. There is another property worth mentioning called uh, is running slowly. It tells you if update is taking longer to run than draw, so you can start dropping things if necessary. We we'll actually gets used in a second, but that that's how you would keep track of your timing. Uh, player lives, and then I have it set up in my player code when we get into it that it throws an exception when the game's over, when you run out of lives, and then from here I can remove all the asteroids from the screen, I remove all the bullets from the screen, I remove the player who died, and then set it to game over and check the score against the high score ranking. This guy is just a web service. It's a standard web service. We created one in two seconds. I can show you the code for it if you want to see it. It is like that long. It hits an XML file and goes, you placed eighth, and tells you you placed eighth. And they can save it. So notice that a lot of this stuff is taking care of itself, because that's not very long for the amount of things going on. Because I have all these guys running independently. We'll start with the player class. Uh, the statics get more important in the other classes, especially the asteroids when there's eight types of asteroids. I cache all their images at the beginning in a static array so that I load them once at the beginning and I can randomly pick one when I create a new guy. But generally speaking, because of the amount of time it takes to load content, if you only need it once, throw it in a static object so you can reuse it. I keep track of where he's at. Keep track of whether of the score. Here we're just saying, hey, every 30,000 points, give him an extra life. This is when he's going to get to 30,000 points next. If you got an extra life, give him an extra life. There's that. If you ran out of lives, throw the exception. He gets the control state passed in as, an, as the interface at the beginning of the level. Loads himself up, once again, only do it the first time. And then when I begin, since I pass that in, here's where I say move him left, right, up, down, based on what I got out of the control state. Make sure he doesn't go off the screen. And if you fired a bullet, create a new bullet. And I actually make bullets cost points, because I'm mean like that. And for staying alive for another frame, get a point. When you draw them, just take the position on the screen, take the picture of the icon. This color white is for shading. Uh, generally speaking, yeah. Generally speaking, you want to keep the uh, keep that white. That means use the uh, use the exact color that's in the bitmap. If it's not white, what it does is it does a bitmap against the RGB value, and it so it ends up tinting at that color. If you've got a white block and you say make it blue, then it'll basically strip out all the red and green, and you'll end up with it being blue. That's all the player's doing. It's a reusable comp component. I could put it a second. I could bank a player too, pass them in the controller state for the second controller if we were on something that didn't have a limited controller state, and they could independently move because they're separate objects. The asteroids are even simpler. There is a static random number generator, and then I statically keep track of the uh, all the asteroids. But other than that, we've got its position. It's where I statically load all those sprites. When it updates, when it creates himself, I give it, I randomly pick a kind of vector down and a position at the top of the screen. Every frame, he just moves down that path, and I tell him to get rid of himself if he falls off the screen. 
and then I tell him to draw himself. All it is. Bullets do the exact same thing. This star guy is fascinating for one point and one point only. Remember at the beginning of the game, I created 100 stars to twinkle in the background. This guy is completely self-contained. To begin with, they kind of twinkle. To do that, you see I have this bitmap that's got nine parts in it. Each step in the frame of the animation. When I created a new one at the beginning, I actually randomly picked one of those frames so that they're not all twinkling at the same rate. And then I put one at a random place on the screen and I actually pick a random color for them. Remember that color parameter we talked about earlier? I'm randomly picking a color this way. If you'll notice, for an RGB value, there's four values there. There's also an alpha value, which is the uh, transparency. So you can make it dimmer or lighter. Or you can, you know, if it's on top of something else, it's how much you can see of the under thing <coughs> beneath it. I believe alpha is the first one. No, alpha is the last one. So that's transparency. There's that is running slowly. I'm not worried about the stars twinkling if the game's having problems chugging along, so the star can stay static in the background. I create a rectangle. It's the section of the frame I'm on, so I'm only displaying that part of it. Uh, and then I say, if I'm at, if I went all the way to the end, move back to the beginning, move the star to a new place, color them something different. Otherwise, just go to the next frame of animation. When I draw them, I say take my sprite, take that individual part of the sprite, I'm sorry, take that position on the screen, that individual part of the sprite, and color them that color. That just runs in the background and completely takes care of himself. That is what components are meant for, by the way, is stuff like that that you can throw in the background, not on, you know, create at the beginning, they take care of themselves, you don't ever have to worry about them again. There is a big argument about how people use uh, components. If you go to the forums on the app up, you'll see all sorts of arguments about people saying that components should be used for everything and people saying components should be removed. So if you ever want to see that argument, it's there. So that's how all my stuff's happening in the background. Here's the fascinating part. When I'm drawing these guys, first of all, I created a, a separate one for the splash screen. I say, if we're in the splash screen, give me a white background. During the first second, do nothing. During the second second, fade in that first logo, wait a second, fade in the second logo, wait a second, then the timer kicks off and it pulls it out of the state. We're going to do this in Mango as a silver light application, and it's a lot easier than manually manipulating this. Although normally, during normal game, paint the screen black. If we have the ranking information, which we'll go into in a moment, display it. For game over, say game over. If we're in the menu, say they can tap the screen to begin. If it were paused, you can pause it. Give myself the scores and the number of lives, and that's it. Uh, one of the biggest problems with components, and you'll see us get around this when we do this in the mixed mode project, is the sprite batch is indeed a batch, and it actually displays things from front to back. The first thing you paint in a sprite batch is in the very back, and you can lay things on top of it as you go down. And it's a one-time batch, paints the back buffer so it can be brought forward. Everything drawing in the components, I can't guarantee the order they're getting called, so I may get stars appearing on top or below things. I may get asteroids appearing in weird order. Uh, when we get to the second project, you'll see how we can get around this. How am I doing on time? I'm, okay, I need to speed up a little bit. Then my, my standard service code, when the game ends, I say, go send the score to the uh, send the score to the web service. 
you remember at the beginning I talked about a couple things I had wired up that I said I'd get back to? These are all the callbacks from those 18% service calls. So they're just saying, hey, when you get done with asking if the uh, what the guy's ranking was, go to display ranking. Standard callbacks. Got all that stuff hiding back here. So we display the ranking after it comes back. I say, hey, here's your ranking. And then I show an on-screen keyboard that says, type in your name if you want it to submit it to the high score list. Once they click submit, here's where I actually submit the score if they submitted it or if they just hit cancel. I just display the top 10 list. After the score is submitted, display the top 10 list. Here's where I loop through the, the list of the results so I can paint it. Uh, notice I have spaces here. In the other one, there are nice, good backslash tabs, but in my score font, I didn't include the font character. It's a really interesting error to track down. I'm only including everything from space to lowercase c. Tabs 9, I start at 32. So yeah, it said, what's this tab character you're talking about? I don't know what that is. The good news is, if you're only going to be using numbers per se, you can say, give me only the numbers. And it makes that sprite, that sprite font small when it exists on your phone. However, you can then not have a character like the tab key because you don't want all the stuff that comes before. So you kind of have to be careful with what you're doing when you're actually dealing with the sprite font, and that's what that stuff is. By default, you get from 0 to Z and the special characters that are kind of fillers between the letters and the numbers. But we, just, we basically just display the results, and then it goes. The beauty about having a developer unlocked phone is I can actually port straight to the device, and I can debug straight on the device. Ta-da! Now for the benefit of the people who are watching this on a screen cap, uh, to the emulator. I actually show the high score service here real quick. Oh, 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 okay. It's going to take a second. Because remember, I'm running off my phone. Normally, it doesn't happen. Okay. It came up, said, okay, well, you got number eight, enter your name. I can come in here, say, okay, my name is Chris. This is a known bug in this interface type. I'll show you how we did this in a second. This is one of the reasons why the Silverlight mix mode is a good thing. I say OK, and it's going to come up, and there I am. It shows me that I play safe. And then repeat until blue in the face. There, in a nutshell, we just created a game for the Windows Phone. That guide begin show keyboard is that control that popped out. I almost forgot to mention that part. That's about the only way in an XNA game you can get a keyboard. It's the equivalent of on the Xbox 360 how when you want to type something in, all of a sudden this big pain comes up with the keyboard. It's the exact same thing. However, we can close the Zoom software now too. Now let's talk about the new Mango features. Like I said, the future is now, or at least it was on May 24th when these things were released. This thing is still in beta, heavily in beta. I've had to reinstall it five times this week. I had to reinstall it twice last night when I was doing the final tweaks of this talk, okay? Just know this before you get started. I have crashed the emulator irreparably more times than I can count. However, it's still really nifty. Here's the beta tools. You can't put it on the phone yet. Notice how I said the emulator was really buggy and crashed a lot? That's why you can't put it on the phone yet. They promise before it actually gets released as a global update to the phone, developers will be able to put it on a developer unlocked phone. They haven't said when. I have a feeling they said that this stuff was coming in the May update, and they ran out of May. 
Uh, like I said, the manual is a little unstable, but you can create Silverlight apps with XNA rendering. It is a Silverlight app, and there is a hack to make XNA work in it. Works really well, but it's it's not what you were thinking about when you originally promised it a long time ago. So, where we originally had a game class, we now have a phone application page. The phone application page, instead of having the game time object you had before, has an object called the game timer. The game timer is what actually is calling update and uh, update and draw. And you'll notice that they're not straight functions, they're actually events. There is no real load or unload. You have these two new methods you have to deal with called on navigated to and on navigated from. Since it's a Silverlight app, it actually goes onto the back stack so that like it pauses itself if somebody calls you. Uh, if you hit if you have two or three things open, or if you hit the guide button, I mean it goes straight back, it saves its position, you can back to it, you can forward to it, it, it all saves like that. So the on navigated to and on navigated from lets you pause the game so you don't have silver or X and A running in the background eating your battery. Don't forget to hit pause. Uh, and then instead of the, the generic graphics driver we had now, we have the shared graphics device manager. It gives you the exact same thing, it's just named differently. Just enough to drive you crazy if you're porting code and you got to change all the references. Why would you want to do this? X and A is really good for low-level hardware control. If you like to control every little thing and have every little piece in control of everything that's going on, XNA gives you that and more. It's bad for UI. Janky little window to get a, it's a pop-up window to get a keyboard. It's formatted bad. You can't really do good UI with it. Had to draw all that stuff on the screen. Not really good for that. Serverlight is really good for UI. Can't do much else than UI with it. So this gives you a best of both worlds. There's a great example on the App Hub of a program that is a 3D rendering of this little tank. And then it has all these Silverlight overlays onto it where you can rotate the tank and change the lighting and whatever. It switches in Silverlight that then affects the actual rendering. It's a very complex example, though. So now we can use both. What happens is that we have this Silverlight page that we go to and then starts acting like X and A. But we still have that Silverlight page running in the background, so I can actually go into the XAML and take elements, turn them on, turn them off, move them around, do everything like I would with a standard Silverlight application, and then I call this class called the UI Element Renderer, and I say, give me a snapshot of what that XAML looks like right now. And then I have a texture that I can just render with my sprite brats. Uh, however, keep in mind that that XAML is always present on the screen because you are running a Silverlight application. So if you just hide a text box and you accidentally touch the text box, the keyboard will pop up mid-game. I've had it happen. You have to learn these things the hard way. So, let's look at a demo of that. Like I said, wishing even more luck this time because uh, we're dealing with beta code. So here's our mixed mode app. When this project creates, you still get your mixed mode content, which still has my same stuff in it. However, there's an app XAML which actually controls the application. There's a main page XAML, a main page XAML.cs, which is actually by default when you start the project, you'll get that page. It will open to that page, and there'll be a button that says, press me to enter XNA rendering mode. By default, that's what you get. You would never use that in real life, but that's what you get. Uh, I've actually overloaded this guy to become the splash page. So if you look at the XAML forum, same standard XAML browser, I've got a grid. The grid's got a stack panel. I've got a storyboard animation that says take one second, beginning at one second, take that company logo, make the, op the opacity go from zero to one, fade it in. Got the exact same thing for the conference logo. Standard, everyday XAML. In the actual code, at the beginning, I start a timer that waits five seconds, and then I tell those two animations to begin. When that timer clicks, I remove 
itself from the back panel so you don't accidentally get back to the splash screen and I say move forward to the actual game. Normally the, the on click of the button they put on the screen does that navigate to the game page. But that's a lot cleaner than that weird manual reference of using the game time to set the up. This, there's one example of where this fits in nicely. When you actually get into your game timer, here's your on navigated to that I mentioned before. You actually have to tell it, okay, we're going to start. You run. We're going to start rendering X and A now. So we're going to share the graphics mode between both X and A and Silverlight. Create our sprite batch. This is the UI element renderer where I'm saying, hey, for this page, I'm going to render the entire page at some point in time. So I set that guy up. And then I say, if this is the first time I've actually navigated to the game, yeah, this is the first time I've navigated to the game, I need to actually create all those stars. Can't do it in the thread like before, so there's a bit of a, of a hit when it does it. And then I go to the menu, if it was that time. Why do I only do it? If it was on loading, because remember that whole part about pausing it and going to the back stack? We navigated away from it, we stopped the timer, which in effect turns the X and A-ness of it off, but it's just sitting there waiting dormant for us. We don't actually have to enable and disable the components because it shuts everything off for us. Which is why I don't need to create 100 stars again. It's already been done. They're just waiting. So here, like I said, we've got a standard Silverlight page running in the background. We've got a full-blown XAML here, and if you look, I've defined most of the HUD on it. How much time do I have left? Is it 10 minutes or? I don't remember what time. What time are we supposed to end? It, oh, that's right, it is 11. Good. So I got 25 minutes. There's my store, my score containers. Under them, I've got just field labels where I can draw the number of lives, draw the screen. They're standard text blocks. Silverlight, no big deal. Then I create a grid for this area. There's my tap screen to begin. It's just hidden right now. It's my ranking. Either you did by default you did not rank or here's where the magic's gonna happen eventually. I actually have a text box and a button. Remember me mentioning that they're still there even if you can't see them? That's why they're disabled to begin with. You'll be surprised when you find that. Every time. Every time. There's a big block for the high score list, and then down at the bottom there's a there's the game over panel. So all those elements I was manually drawing before with the sprite font are now statically being held on the page, being done through Silverlight. One, that gets rid of my sprite font, and a lot of those weird calculations to center text around the screen based on the size of the screen and all that other stuff, all that stuff's gone. Oh, one thing I should probably mention. By default, X and A goes in landscape mode. By default, Silverlight goes in portrait mode. Uh, so in the beginning of uh, the opening of your XAMLs, there's a supported orientations and then a starting orientation. Uh, you would have to you have to manually go in there and change those. By default, it says you can be in portrait and to start in portrait. Uh, if you want to be able to support it, being able to flip, you can say supported orientation is landscape or portrait. So when I die, after I get rid of my items. I turn on those input boxes. I re-enable those input boxes. I turn on the label that says game over and I go check the player's ranking. Let's 
Let's actually look at that real quick, because that is half the magic. So again, here's that first animation. That's complete silver light. Looks exactly the same as before. That's a silver light dialogue. That's a silver light dialogue. I'm just painting them on the screen. Now we have this nice, beautiful in game silver light control. And we're all doing it actually inside the source. So that's where the real advantage of the two running together works really well. Uh, let's go ahead and back out of that. I don't know why that popped back up. Now, some of the disadvantages. Like I mentioned before, we're not actually running a true game loop. We don't actually get true access to components. If you remember before, I had... list for the bullets and the asteroids and then I had the reference to the player. I also created for this version a list of the stars because now I actually have to manually take care of them. You don't get the true game time that we used to get before. Let's hide the async code which is mostly exactly the same. That we used to get before we now get, because remember these are events now, we get this game timer event argument. And the game timer event argument gets an elapsed time and a timed, you know, a total time, just like the other, just like the other one did. However, you kind of have to manually pass them along as normal. Uh, if you if you're trying to make portable code, you can actually just write a function that takes elapsed time and total time. If you're using the game timer from X and A, you pull those two out, you pass them in. If you're using a mixed mode app, you pull them off, you pass them in. At least it makes your components a little more portable. In my component library, you'll notice now my game components are Mango game components because we don't have components anymore. We're running Silverlight, not X and A. So these all got slightly ported. Uh, the mobile control state now has its own update. It doesn't require any parameters, but it's the exact same thing. Our player most of this is exactly the same, except for an hour update, no parameters, because we didn't need anything. We pass in the sprite batch for the draw. The beauty about this is that, notice here I say I just take in the sprite batch and draw. If the sprite batch wasn't open to begin with, I can catch an exception, because the only thing that throws that exception is if the sprite batch isn't open. So I can say, hey, draw the guy out. If the right batch you passed in wasn't open, go ahead and open it and draw it back out. The beauty of this is now I know the exact order everything's being drawn in. This is the main way people that tell you how to use components on the forums will tell you how to use it anyways, is use the update and manually handle your draw, because then you can know the order things are coming in. Uh, asteroids, if you remember, actually needed to know No, so that's handled somewhere else. One of these guys actually gets where's did I close it? I must have closed it. Uh oh yeah, update game. I thought it was in the component. My bad. Uh when we create the new asteroid, that's where I actually had to pass in the elapsed game time for compatibility reasons. Other than that, it's pretty much the same ported code. However, I have to manually update all my own objects. So here, I manually update the player. As I'm checking my collision detection, I update the asteroids. As I'm checking, I update the bullets. So that's where I'm kind of sneaking in the manual calls to update. In my overall update, Still controlling my control state, but here at the bottom, that's where I'm twinkling the stars myself. When I draw it, same thing. 
I don't have to have that big messy code for the splash screen because it was already taken care of. However, draw all my stars. That way they're in the background. Everything's pasted on top of them. Here's where I take the XAML and say, give me a snapshot of the position of the XAML right now. Paste that to the screen. If we're actually playing the game, draw the player, draw the asteroids, that's it. Because all that text that I was manipulating before is now all being handled actually on the, in that Silverlight render. And there's references to that stuff all over the place. That's where I'm actually, every frame drawing the uh, player score and the number of lives in my async code where I just fill the text box in with the player ranking. It's where I hide the button after they click submit for the player name. The beauty about hiding that stuff like that too is uh, if you play a second time and you've already put a name in, I can remember the name. Theoretically speaking, you can actually force them to log into Xbox Live and pull their gamer tag name. But you can't necessarily guarantee that they're they have uh, Xbox or not Xbox Live, but a, a gamer card is not required for a Windows Phone. So if you do that, you can actually have it in the the the. There's an actual Xbox tab on the phone where you can actually get into Xbox proper, and their game would then end up appearing in there instead of on the main menu. Now, this does make a, a big difference in the way you're programming if you actually want to use one of these. It makes the code slightly less portable between the two because XNA by default is a continuous brute force. It's running, it's very reactive, That's or not very, it's very proactive. You actually have to manage all of your states, you're always running forward, the game loop's always running. This becomes very much an event-driven system since you're running Silverlight WPF. Uh, and your draw and your update are actually being thrown as events. If you wanted to pause the game, all you got to do is turn that timer off. So something you really don't get inside of. Uh, matter of fact, I didn't actually show that. Something you don't actually get inside a pure action head game. When I actually do my pause code, which actually isn't in here because it's for an Xbox 360. Um, for the Xbox 360, you can pause it and actually have to go through and disable all the components because they run full speed ahead unless you tell them otherwise. You disable those events to, from firing, all that stuff stops. Uh, on deactivated, going to pause. This would this would technically be what would handle going to pause if, uh, like, you got a phone call and you didn't want to kill the game, and then when you came back, it would unpause it. We got done a little ahead of time, believe it or not. Are there any questions about this stuff? I'm more than happy to go through more parts of it. We can write code on the fly. I'm good with that. Yes? It's running on our corporate web server back down in Huntsville. If you really want to see the code, I'll pull it up. I've got the project on here. It's four functions. The functions basically are load this XML file in. Yeah. Um, got high score service. There's the service contract. You can get all the top score. You can get all the scores in the XML file. You can get the top however many. You can add one. You can see where a specific score would be in the ranking. The code for it. Get all basic uh, link call. Holds everything out of the XML file here pull everything out or here pull everything out there pull everything out but just return the top 10 adding a score <coughs> creates a score reference saves it and serializes it out check ranking pulls the count of the number of things that are greater than it that's the entire thing as far as the 
Uh, it's running on top of IIS. You can just say publish for here. That's the actual web server it was running on. But uh, you just give it a location and a file system. You actually can do it as a web deploy. You can say, hey, here's the URL. I've actually I've got it running on my laptop too. I can say, go to to local host high score service. You know, look, you know, go to the local host. Here's where it is inside my uh, IIS. I just kind of wanted to make it go to the uh, to the web to show it's actually networking and hide some of the smoke and mirrors. But yeah, cancel it out. Close. No. Uh, where's IIS? Here's my high score service. You switch the content view. I mean, I've, I published the whole thing there, but it's basically just that DLL. There's the actual XML file, and it's just it's just pretty much snaps right in place. Yes. The credentials for the web service, whether it's self-hosted or it's your client app, has that credentials. How do, how do you protect that from encryption or reflection or whatever the app is on? Uh, phone? Is there, how do you yourself figure that out? Um, the way we're doing it is we're just allowing anonymous access to our web service. But yeah, I understand what you're saying, how you don't want to necessarily hard code that, that information in there. Um, there is not a good answer to that. I can, I can think of ways to get around that that are very nasty. One would be used a, a side certificate over, that's actually connecting over HTTPS, so it's actually encrypted as it goes over. You could actually ask for a decryption key that changed over time that unencrypted the password. There's, I mean, get creative. There, there's a way to do it, but as anything that can be broken, it can be unbroken. Okay, somebody may figure out the easy way to connect to my web service and spam my high scoreboard. Do I really care? I mean, April Fool's Day for Woot, people started figuring out the high score service and spam the high scoreboard, but it still didn't mean they could get to the bag of crap. It just means they could spam the high score service. Any other questions? Um, I have discovered some uses for live tiles that would be used for XNA. So theoretically, there would be, you know, like, uh, me and my wife play Words for Friends all the time. I've got the Android version where you could then make that a live tile that could pop up a notification saying, hey, you've got a turn. Um, it uses standard push technology. If you were enough of a Silverlight developer that you knew how to do it beforehand, it would snap in the same way. I haven't personally played with it. Uh, the SDK came out a week ago. Come on. I got that far in a week. Give me some credit. Uh, but yeah, it's certainly available. Yes? Um, I have thought about putting that code... Well, I can't. of course, I can't do the Mango one. But I've thought about putting that code sample up there just so that people can access it. Um, I haven't done, the, the problem is, is there's limitations to the number of things you can publish, and we've got a bunch of ideas at work that we haven't finished yet, so I don't have anything personally done, but I have a bunch of projects that you're not seeing there that actually play around with a bunch of this stuff up. But, yeah. Um, and as far as Xbox Live is, man, there's a lot of polish that goes to an Xbox Live game. If you don't believe me, come next door when we do this. Uh, I'm doing the Xbox Live talk next, and uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes on to that one. Any other questions? Yep. The X and A versus Silverlight. The most um, preference or line of business. Or Literally, the way they designed it was Silverlight has all the nifty stuff that you have access to for for uh, business type applications, and the the X and A stuff is almost just good for games. Yes, there's times for the application purposes you may want that low-level access, but then you lose that nice, you know, those nice UI features. Same way with so uh, with XNA, you may want that, you know, that input box that you just don't get or looks 
you know, looks horrible. Yeah, that that was not an orientation issue on the uh, the X and the Pure X and A game where the buttons were on the side, but it's no, that's the way that box looks, and you can't change that. It's a known bug that Microsoft decided they didn't care about because the screen worked. You know, there's that type of presentation issue you just really don't get a get an access to. Uh, I think you're going to start seeing a lot more of the mixed mode games now. Uh, I didn't actually pull one up for some strange reason, but the the way you actually get to one of those is when you say a new project is that is actually the Windows Phone rich graphics application, and that's what is doing the the XNA and the Silverlight mix. Anything else? Uh, if you got any other questions any other time? Feel free to come up, and walk to me in the hall. Uh, I'll be basically available. Any time after the next session, except for when I go take this heavy Xbox back to my hotel room.